Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to punch, chop, and kick your way through the greatest era of action movies. And boy, howdy, do we have a real action movie this week. Not like that stupid, lame, no retreat, no surrender last week. <gasps> dare you talk about that movie like that <laughs> i take it back i take it back because i have a feeling by the end of this i'm gonna swoon over this movie um but I'm, it's, it's not gonna dethrone seattle karate so i'm just gonna just gonna say that early <laughs> but i am gonna swoon over this amazing fantastic karate movie representing the great city of los angeles we are, of course, talking about Blood Fist. It originally premiered on September 22nd, 1989. It is written by Robert King, who is notable for being married to writer Michelle King. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and that's the end. Actually, as a couple, they've written a couple of TV shows. They're pretty popular. Uh, they wrote The Good Wife and they wrote The Good Fight. So. Uh, you mean he? Oh. She wrote that, and he just was added his name onto it. <laughs> it's just got right it. in the coattails. <laughs> yeah, got it. It is directed by Terrence Winkless. Now, Terrence, <laughs> that name, <laughs> Terrence, man, I love you. I love, I love because we have never ta- had an opportunity to be able to talk about this. Terrence didn't direct a whole bunch of movies. He's you know some stuff here and there, kind of pulling out some random stuff. He directed a bunch of stuff. For the producer of this movie, which I'm going to come back to in just a second. But his real claim to fame is that he played Bingo the Gorilla on the Banana Splits Adventure Hour. Wow. I don't know what that is, but wow. (laughs) Dude, can you imagine? I'm a famous actor, but I'm only famous because I dressed up in a gorilla suit for a children's (laughs) show. That's it. No one ever saw my face. No one ever knew that I was the one in the costume. Some bar somewhere, Barney's sitting, telling people, like, I I was famous once. (laughs) I was going to say, I think you're speaking Barney's pain that he never got noticed. (laughs) Now, Terrence did direct a whole bunch of movies for the producer of this movie. And the producer is the amazing, fantastic, one of the greatest producers ever to grace Hollywood, Roger Corman. And this is the first Ah. Roger Corman movie that we've had on this podcast, too. Not the first that Dominic has swooned over, though. (laughs) If it was all my choice, we would have Roger Corman movies every week. I love the man. I love everything that he's about. I love the 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 one hundred page scripts, the ninety minute requirement for movies. I I just love all of it. (laughs) And there's never going to be another Roger Corman because of like the streaming stuff. Just like there's never going to be another Canon. Canon films. Yeah, yeah, there's never going to gonna be an, another Canon films because there's just too much pressure to turn a profit or there's like fundraising, there's Kickstarter and all this kind of stuff. Roger Corman, the, all his movies made money. Now, they didn't take that much to make and they didn't have, that means they didn't have to make much money to but be they able did to break make even. Money. But there's so many people that got their opportunity to start because there was just some 90 minute Roger Corman movie that was like a rip off of some other movie. Yeah, huh. <laughs> a I don't know if it's hmm, a rip off of another <laughs> movie. <It> sounds familiar. <laughs> And I don't know if it's fair to say we'll never see one again because all it li- literally all it's going to take is for someone like Amazon or one of these streaming services to go, you know what? We can make a crap ton of these really cheap movies and then it all starts over again. That's true. There has to just be one studio out there. If only they could pair the two together. If they're like that person who's thinking about that starts their own company and they call it like Roger Corman presents Canon Films kind of <laughs> stuff. Don't, like, don't. <laughs> <laughs> We're right in my wheelhouse and if we're able to do that. So we did want to pause right here and talk about why we chose this movie. And actually, I believe all of us are going into this movie blind. We wanted to get a good mix of movies that we had seen versus movies that we hadn't seen, but obviously were big deals in the genre. And one of the things, at least for me, that made me want to learn more about this was the fact that they are there is eight of these movies. So they just <laughs> kept going. Again and again. And all eight of them star Don Wilson. The man. The man. Don the Dragon Wilson. Yes. I just want to start off listen how his IMBD starts off. Don the Dragon Wilson is considered the greatest kickboxing champion in the sports history. Wow. Wow. Yes. Okay. That's yes. some strong words. So, right off the bat, on his IMBD, greatest kickboxing champion ever. You know. <laughs> Suck it, Billy Blanks. <laughs> now, hey, 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 hey. I joke 
we I've joked before, but if you follow our Twitter or Facebook or you follow me personally on the internet, you know I talk a lot about Billy Blanks. We love and, Billy Blanks. Yes. And as soon as I saw that Billy Blanks yes. was in this movie, I was like, I'm in. Like and he's on the cover. I'm in. Now I have fucking complaints yes. about <laughs> the level of Billy Blanks involvement in this movie. <laughs> Give the man a line, okay? <laughs> One line in the movie, please. Since Don Wilson is the star and since he is the greatest kickboxing champion in the history of the world, <laughs> uh, I, I guess we should just kind of talk. So he plays Jake Ray in this movie, but he's a real life kickboxing champion from South Florida. He fought banning four decades. And Damn. won 11 championships. So I Damn. guess he's kind of got a right to say it. <laughs> so he posted a record of 72, 5, and 2 with 47 knockouts. Wow. So I mean, wow. He fought all the way into the 90s. In fact, he had a comeback in 1999. Damn. He did beat such champions as Dennis Alexio, Oak Tree Edwards, and the great Dick Kimbler. <laughs> Kimber. <laughs> So if we have no idea Don who Wilson, any of those people are. I'm going to have to trust you on all of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, just trust me, man. He beat Big Dick Kimber. <laughs> I have no idea who Dick Kimber is. Don Wilson's made a crap ton of movies. So I could go on forever naming off a, a bunch of the, the Kung Fu stuff. But from like a bigger name movie, he was the gang leader in Batman Forever. Oh, yeah. Oh my god. Uh, he was. <laughs> he played he played Wilson in the nineteen eighty eight The Expendables, so like the original Expendables franchise. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. He is the sparring partner in the movie Say Anything. Oh yeah. Oh my I'm god. I trust you on that one. <gasps> he is. <laughs> Oh my god. He is, uh, and then he's a corpseman in Born on the Fourth of July. That's a big one. Yeah. He's also Johnny Wu in the movie Ring of Fire. He's still acting, and right now he has two movies in pre-production. The one that I, that caught me was My Grandpa the Assassin. He is currently <laughs> working on My Gran My Grandpa the Assassin. So look for Don Wilson. In well, that John, up. I hear you on all this stuff and all these other great movies that he's been in, and in cameos and a bunch of stuff, and you know. But I, can't, I keep coming back to Blood Fist, and there's. There's something really fun about having eight movies and all, that also st all star Don the Dragon Wilson in it. And I think you know what I'm getting at is what's up with these other six movies? <laughs> that he's yes, in. I had to know, too. I had to look at what was actually going on with. The, why are these movies so popular? Why do they keep making them? He returns as the same character in the second one. He is fighting to help an old friend. Uh, to save an old friend from a madman. In the very open of the next movie, apparently he goes back to fighting, and he's a champion again, and he kills the actor who plays his brother in the first one at the <laughs> opening of the second one. If you watch both movies, because I almost did it, I almost accidentally watched the second one first. <laughs> They're identical on how they open because his brother is getting his butt kicked in both of them. But in only one movie, he's his brother. <laughs> So Did they also, film at the same time. You must do it like back to back. Also, <laughs> let's just use the same actor. The, the bad guy in Blood Fist, his also shows up in Blood Fist too as a different character, not the bad guy. But so, but the other bad guy, the other one. No, the actual bad guy. Well, oh, okay. Thing. Yeah. So <laughs> not the bad guy. Dude. Yeah. So <laughs> his manager actually shows up in the second one as someone named Naw. Oh, <laughs> as if no one would notice that. Oh, so, yeah. Doesn't as no one would notice that the. That I, I'm pretty sure at the end he kills him, right? Yeah, what yeah. The hell? yeah, at the end. Apparently, after the second one, guys, they decided, well, you know what? We better change it up. Jake is now unjustly accused of a crime and fighting for justice. So they changed it. So now he's a character named Jimmy Bolin. <laughs> and so from Blood Fist 3 on, he is a different character in every movie, still played by Don W. I don't understand why, because they could have easily tied some of these movies together. So follow me on this, okay? <laughs> Blood Fist 3 is Jimmy Boland, who is unjustly accused of a crime and fighting for justice. Blood Fist 4, he's now Danny Holt, and he unknowingly repossesses the car of a powerful arms dealer, and it sets off of a chain of events, including the killing of, a, of his friends and the kidnapping of his daughter. That leads to Blood Fist 5, where he plays Jim Stanton, who struggles to regain his memory and know who to trust and which side he's fighting for. 
And then in Blood Fist 6, he plays Nick Corrigan, <laughs> after, who is a military courier uh, who just happens to be making a visit to a nuclear weapons site when terrorists take over. <laughs> um, and then he becomes Jim Trudell and branded a cop killer, must fight to stay alive and prove his innocence from the cops who framed him. So, which kind of sounds like number three. <laughs> <laughs> and then at number eight, he plays Rick Cohen, a former retired CIA agent who is attacked by the very assassins that he's tra- that he spent his career training. So I'm just saying, Rick Cohen could have been involved in number six's terrorists taking over the nuclear weapons launch. I don't understand how you could go that many movies and not call back to the original. Unless he wrote some of these. Why did they never change the actor? <laughs> why did they keep bringing him back as someone else? <laughs> My other question is, why can't this all be the life and times of Jake Ray? Why can't he be this s- retired CIA champion karate <laughs> fighter fugitive from the police? Why can't he just have this epic freaking backstory at this point? Yeah, he just becomes this unstoppable killer. And because of his past... He he just like bounces around from place to place. And then when people figure him out, he just moves on. I think so. we should just say what why they didn't do it. It's because no one was watching these movies. <laughs> I'm just saying. After like the second one, who's continuing to watch Blood Fist? <laughs> us. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say us. Yeah, true story. <laughs> well, I think that's enough backstory on Blood Fist and why we chose this movie because there is so much to love about this movie, Melissa. <laughs> only positive feedback. I have plenty of positive feedback. <laughs> About how well, let's get into how movie. great this movie is. <laughs> let's go break down this movie, Blood Fist. So right out of the gate, I got to give this movie credit because they're not just here's this person that was in the movie. They give their full backstory in the in the introduction. So it shows the names of the actresses they come on screen in this very beginning yep. of the movie. Eight time champion, this four time champion, that Billy Blanks. 12-time champion this or whatever. Like This shows all their stats, right? You're getting pumped because you know you're uh-huh. going to see some good karate. <laughs> <laughs> this movie is known for a bunch of different fighting styles all in the same movie. It's unfortunate the story gets in the way. <laughs> <laughs> unfortunate that the story is terrible. <laughs> that is a pretty good point. Everything with this movie and the fact that like they have all these cool different karate styles, like they really don't focus on it at all. Something else that you notice right from the very beginning is that is the overdubbing. The sound effects are like video game sound effects. So the punching and like the slaps and the kicks and stuff like that. Melissa's laughing. We're going to get to baby's voice later. (laughs) (laughs) Poor baby. Why does he talk like that? But the sound effects are up to full volume. And in the very beginning, you get this sense. It's like, I don't know, some sort of fighting tournament. uh, A a kumite fight like you know all this you know like like some other blood 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 movie like a sport sport, maybe like a sport of blood blood. that's what this is or a tournament sport (laughs) yeah it's a tournament of all the best fighters in In different different, fighting styles in a different country where people can also die it involves betting so does does blood sport (laughs) well you know this one's different but that one's computers true story okay so you got that (laughs) <laughs> yeah, the Kumite is supposed to be underground, and that like the, the police in Thailand can't go in there because they're like, well, I don't know, I don't know where it happened. That yeah, the whole thing about this is like this is like the entire economy of Manila is this fight. <laughs> so like at least in the Chinatown of Manila, what we see in the very beginning is this dude just getting destroyed, but then he looks off into the crowd and you realize he's losing on purpose, and then decides he's getting beat up too bad that he's just going to snatch like Brad Pitt and snatch just get up and then beat the living fuck out of the person that he was fighting with before and then the shadowy figure in the crowd that he was clearly supposed to lose for storms off while this guy wins his championship okay but he killed so the other I, guy. I just so like let's put that yeah that's he, the big thing <laughs> yeah I wanted to make sure that I pointed out that he so yeah you're right he does kill the person that's, that's not going to come up later, though. None of this beginning stuff is going to matter. That happened in the fight. What's going to matter later, right, is when he's drunk, stumbling the streets after his win, and then he gets attacked by a man, a shadowy man. 
a short, there. shadowy man <laughs> with wild, crazy hair. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Oh man, he just jumps out like surprise ninja attacks him. That would be hard enough to fight off sober, but drunk? I mean, come on. There's just no way. <laughs> Don't stand a chance. <laughs> Even with that extra kidney. <laughs> <laughs> so then you see he gets destroyed again, right? So in the opening, he's losing. Then he, he, he's getting beat up bad, but he decides to get up. He's going to win. He kills the other man. And then he gets beat up really bad in the streets. And then this homeless guy steals his hat too, like and everything and, and his, his wallet, his cash. Stuff, that's yeah. right, he got he gets all that stuff too. It's a lot of cash. And then that's it for Manila. We hop back over to L.A. We start out in L.A. with Jake giving like a speech to some very important clients of his with his manager. <laughs> so now I'm joking. He's talking to a, apparently some school kids. So, and one of them asks if he still fights. He's clearly, he's a retired fighter. Him and his manager go around, tell kids to stay in school. This is their gym. Something. Yeah, it's, it's his karate place. He it's owns Hal that and karate. Jake's gym. And yeah. we have another, um, the, our next ah. movie. And this going to be a theme, I think, with all the karate movies. That they're giving the planet fitness routine to all these kids to come join their, to go join Hal and Jake's gym. Exactly. It's going to be in all the movies. Yeah. So that's what he's doing. He's giving gotcha. them a feel about why they should take karate at his school. And then they ask him, like, were you really a champion? He explains, like, no, I wasn't actually a champion because my half-brother needed a kidney. And so I gave him my kidney, and now I'm not allowed to fight because it's too dangerous when you only have one <laughs> kidney. You and can't then, fight with one kidney. No, yeah, no. Yeah, no. and then the kids I mean, are like, you're joking. And he's like, yeah, no, actually, I was attacked with a bunch of men with knives, and they stabbed me all in the same spot. See, he <laughs> looks like a scar. <laughs> See, and that could have happened when he saved that nuclear weapons site. <laughs> I'm just no, See, that's, no, why okay, they, right. that's why they had to change the character because the one kidney thing, although it never comes, it comes up, up again, again, it's never addressed. And he also becomes a bigger fighter in number two. But the kidney yeah, thing was eventually apparently... going to catch up with him. It never even comes up again. But they do squeeze in the story piece to make sure that you know it's his half brother. Because they're not Mm -hmm. the same. (laughs) Shortly after this scene, we get a scene where he's on the phone and he gets a call. And it's basically them, the police calling and telling him that his brother's dead. So I guess the good news is, is that he can get that kidney back. (laughs) Well, 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 wait a minute. (laughs) You would think that until he gets there and realizes his brother is already in a jar. Because they don't mess around in Manila. They got things to do. They don't care that you haven't like been claimed. They're like, just burn that shit. Just, just, yeah. just cremate them. Just throw them in the throw them in the pit and we put them in a box. Just throw them in. Are you I love it. Me, yeah, he just walks in. He's like, I, I think it's in that jar right there. He's in yeah, that he, one. yeah, he's like, I think that's the one. Yeah, that's him. He's telling me I'm awesome. That there's a chance that they don't put him in a full casket. Nope. And then cremate him in the full casket. Nope. <laughs> oh, so movies have been lying to me all yep. this time. Yeah, what do you think? They they get the $3,000 caskets and burn them <laughs> up with the body? No. By the way, the guy that plays the cop, his name is Vic Diaz. Once again, I love IMBD. And so, like, I love to pull stuff directly out of people's bios. So directly from Vic Diaz's bio... It says, Vic reigns supreme as the jolly, evil, fat man of Filipino exploitation cinema. Damn. Oh, wow. Time out. I want to know more about Filipino exploitation film. Yeah, where are those? (laughs) Where can we find them? I want to know more. Yeah, the chief or the police officer or whatever, the detective, whatever he is, here he is in a jar. And uh, you should leave town today because I don't want you causing any revenge problems in my city. Because he knew. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he knew exactly what was going to happen. But instead, Jake just goes to some random spot and dumps his I brother in the water. He's like, I-, I really love you. <laughs> yeah. Let me dump don't you, you need a this- permit for that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, don't you want to take him home? <laughs> yeah. Does he have like? Do they have parents and stuff? No, all they have is Hal at home. He's just Hal. Just, I, running, even- just <laughs> running the gym, waiting for him to come back. <laughs> And they don't even show took him like somewhere special or anything. Like he literally just like walked out of the police station, went down the street, just dumped him out in like a <laughs> sewer somewhere. That's the motion too. He doesn't like like slowly shake him out like while saying a prayer or something like that. Like brother, I'm gonna get revenge. And it just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like like when you're trying to get the last of the ketchup out of the bottle, like bangs off the top of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's like. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't even keep the jar either like nothing no, and then, so so now 
He's gotten rid of his brother's remains. He's all done with that. So I guess now it's time to sightsee. Because, <laughs> I mean, he has no other reason to be there. So, and he decides to walk down to, he sees a karate school. Where he sees a bunch of people wearing geese with similar to the cloth that was found with his brother when he was murdered. Then becomes this great scene where, one, this karate club, by the way, just... They've got some interesting members, including the bald white guy out front. <laughs> he goes to the gate. They won't let him in. And so then he goes, hides his bag under some leaves and decides to hop the fence and then gets chased around. I want to come back so, because he climbs the wall and then he's looking over and the people in the dojo see him and they, they're just looking at him. Like, yeah. <laughs> But then the landscapers see him and they come up on the wall to fight him because that's what those guys are. You see him earlier on the wall. They're walking along the yeah. wall. They're like trimming bushes and stuff like that. And they got that stick and they come up there to fight him. John, you got to step your fucking game up. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know I should be including protection in my pro uh, for, for our maintenance of properties. Like that is, I need to know, like I need to arm my guys with more than rakes because apparently, um, apparently you need more than a rake to fight Jake because he just... Beats the crap out of him off the wall, and then it turns into like a Benny Hill chase scene <laughs> down the wall. We never get a good explanation because the next thing we know, he's walking through the club with his manager. <laughs> when he defeats the landscapers up on the wall, the people inside start clapping for him, and Chin Wu gets all mad and he murders someone that he's like practicing with, and, he and then storms everybody. off. <laughs> but when Jake finally comes back to get his back, he saw what was inside. He saw that this was like a really advanced karate place. The land, Even the landscapers are legit. He goes back to his bag and knows this bag is stolen. Oh, my God. Who would have saw this coming? <laughs> but luckily for him, it was stolen by someone drawing in the park and kept it at his house. Yeah. He's That's, like, oh, I have it. Don't worry. Come to my house and we'll pick it up. That's just great because when he first meets him, he's like just some random guy painting. So he's, hi, I'm an artist and life coach Kwong. Come with <laughs> me and I will give you your bag back. <laughs> if I've ever heard a Ponzi scheme, it's Kwong's pitch. Too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I love the first, one of the first things he tells him, too. is like, oh, those guys are red fists. They're a bunch of dicks. Don't worry about them. Here in Manila, we, are, we bet on everything. <laughs> After Jake meets Kwong, obviously Kwong's going to be a big part of this story. They go to a bar, and this is where we meet Baby. Baby and all these other fighters who are there for the Blood Fist tournament or the Tauching or whatever it is, they're in town for that because that's going to be going on. It's a bunch of kick-ass kickboxers. They're all in this bar. They're all super testosterone up. And even one of them's harassing the waitress. Baby stops them from doing that and gives her a bunch of money. It's like, hey, why don't you just leave? Here's all the money that, that you can make for today. Why don't you just leave? And then he sees Jake and immediately starts a fight. In the very beginning, I couldn't figure out what the fuck was going on. Why all of a sudden he just ran across it and he's talking about pair of twos and all this stuff. And it wasn't until almost at the end it dawned on me like, oh, he was staging the fight because he, he knew he was going to lose. Yeah, he was like yelling out as he was yes. wrestling with him like, I didn't have mm -hmm. the cards. I was bluffing. Pair of twos. And he's like, a pair of twos, you idiot. And then like <laughs> wrestling around and then yeah. he's like, throw me through the table. And he didn't, and he like threw him at <clears> the <throat> banister. And he's like, ow, that hurt. And he got some, he did end up, they fought, he got the money, and then they, like, ran out together. And that's how they become yeah, best friends. Yeah, so the good friends. news is, <laughs> because I think, I think we were all confused, too, but the good news is, is that Jake figured it out, and then they go out, and yeah, they just become best buds. So, like, he takes them home, decides that he's just going to live with him from then on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of weird, but okay. <laughs> this is when, also, we meet Nancy, who is Baby's sister. Uh, so, and, and okay. in a minute, we're also going to talk about everyone's love of rooftops. But first, <laughs> let me just get this out of the way. Nancy is played by Riley Bowman. Riley Bowman really didn't do much else other than this, except for she was in a porn called Stolen Kisses in 2001. She's not the main one. And then Baby Davies is played by Michael <laughs> Sh Shanner. Shaner. He plays McCleary in Lethal Weapon, the original. Really? He is also in The Expert with James Brolin from 1995. And he played Constantino in the TV show Nightman from 97 to 99. And I just included that because the Nightman giveth. <laughs> 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 Sorry. 
<laughs> Sorry. So this Nightman TV show is based on, just follow me, a, a saxophonist named Johnny Domino gets struck by lightning and finds himself telepathically synced to evil. <laughs> um, and it starred Matt McCollum, a.k.a. Agent Thompson, from the Matrix Reloaded movie. Oh, okay. oh that guy. And I want to go back to Baby because I want to talk about not just that scene and his outlandish action, but also his dubbing on his voice. Why? Because they clearly didn't use his regular voice, right? They dubbed in someone else. I think they did use his. I don't know. I can't but then figure it out. Did they re-record it later? Because he sounds like he's doing the person who's doing the the voice for him is doing like a cartoon read. Yeah, I have no idea. I can't figure it out because it's very like high pitched. And that's I couldn't figure it out either because it didn't seem like anyone else was being dubbed. So I couldn't figure out why his yeah. audio was the only one that seemed off. Yeah, that's right. He's right. It wasn't like anyone else was being dubbed except for in the beginning of the movie, like the brother was definitely being dubbed. Yeah. But but him yeah. and the brother were the only it's not like Don Wilson was being I dubbed. I wonder no. I wonder if it's just because I wonder if it's just like those scenes were filmed at the same time and those were dubbed and then they like filmed the rest later and didn't and stopped dubbing it after that or but yeah his that's weird. voice is so bad throughout the whole movie like so when when he gets him and he takes him to his apartment and then he's like this is my sister nancy <laughs> 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 he like runs into the bedroom like what the hell is going well, on <laughs> no you know what i you know what you know what it is he's supposed to be acting drunk yeah um, i know but it's like it's over the top something. though right yeah, it's way over the top, and that's why I was—that's why I thought his audio was off too. But I wonder if that's just him just that, being. He's got a point. It might weird. not be that they dubbed him. He just might be <laughs> in that. He movie, just might be that bad of an actor. He just wasn't that good of an actor. <laughs> yeah, like what, yeah, I mean, all throughout the movie, he's like, "Oh boy," like I don't know, I can't. I don't yeah, know. yeah, it's it's cartoon. He kind of overdoes it throughout the entire movie. Yeah, yeah, like, that makes sense. That he would be like, he was, it was like he was gonna go throw up or something. He's like, oh, this is Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Sorry. So then, baby passes out. Jake sees a note on the mirror and goes up to the roof and he sees Nancy. Now this is this is a great scene. This is by far my favorite scene in the entire movie. Uh -huh, of course, he goes up onto the roof. <laughs> And he sees Nancy. She's dancing around in that like spandex with them with the thong one piece bathing suit over the top of it, right? Yes. She's dancing mm -hmm. around, just like flailing her arms. <laughs> no rhythm to it at all. <laughs> like a sim on fire, flailing her arms around in the air. She finally sees that Jake is there and she turns to him and gets ready to leave. And Jake says, You're really flexible. <laughs> Where did he get that from? <laughs> she was like skipping uh -huh. on the roof, flailing her arms around. She didn't even bend at the waist. She's just like, <laughs> like, a, like a three-year-old, just like prancing around no, on the roof. My favorite part was when she goes and turns off the music, and you're like, oh my god, that was her music because <laughs> it's like flutes or something <laughs> in the background. This is a theme throughout the entire movie because this isn't the only rooftop that they're on. They go to the roof. Like everywhere they go, this is just a, they just end up on the roof, and I'm just wondering why is it? Because we see this in other movies that we watch. Why is it so important for soul searching to have it to have access to a rooftop, and why is that also in, important with interpretive dance? Because it also seems like like that was the only place she could practice. Apparently, I don't know, oh. but. I question Jake's judgment from then on. <laughs> she is not a good dancer. They come downstairs. Baby says some gibberish. And then Jake says, well, um, oh, sorry. That's when Baby says he's going to be staying with us. He's staying with us. It's my sister dancing. She, he's staying with us. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry. I promised him dinner. And she's like, okay. And then, then he goes and he then he's like, okay, whatever. He leaves. And she's like, he won't be offended if you leave. Like, he won't remember this in the morning. And then, and Jake's like, uh, but I'm staying because he said I could stay here and he owes me dinner. And then only Nancy yeah. takes him out to dinner. Yeah, because Jake's, I mean, yeah, Jake, because baby's off with the girl. <laughs> okay, so, so they go out to dinner. They have noodles. He has, he struggles with chopsticks, which is the most American thing I guess you can do. And then they go back to the house. We get a scene with more rooftops because rooftops <laughs> are important. But there's this weird scene with them back at the apartment 
where we meet Angela for the first time. And Angela, she doesn't say anything. She just runs in, gives food to baby, leaves it on the floor for him, and then jumps out the window. <laughs> <laughs> Angela is the waitress from the bar yes. that he pays, and she just immediately falls in love with him, right? Two, the food that she brings him includes two hot dogs. Yes, but okay. I think <laughs> okay. He just didn't meet that waitress at there, and he's defending her because she's the waitress. He says, he goes, that girl's so crazy. She's always doing crazy things. So she's like, they have a thing going on. They've, they before. This is not just like he met her at that bar then and she, and he protected her. Well, that's okay. a let down on the story for me. He then. was protecting her because they've done stuff before. Like they had, a, they had some kind of relationship, okay. but he can't get rid of so her. Like, for- I can't get rid of her. She just keeps coming back. That's what he keeps saying. I'm glad you explained that because from me as a viewer, I saw her briefly at the bar. I didn't understand <laughs> how she fit into everything. And then the next time I'm seeing her, she's bringing him food and jumping out of a window. And I can't figure out why this is the first time I am meeting this lady and why she hasn't even said a word yet, but she's delivering hot dogs through her window. Like I couldn't figure out what the hell was going on here. For the record, she never says one word in the whole movie. No. She just motions, so she must not speak. <laughs> Which is weird, because her name is Marilyn Batista, and she's probably be- made more movies, probably been in more movies than anyone else in this, mo- in this movie. Damn. I mean, she's been in a bunch of war and kung fu movies, all from the 70s and 90s. And I want to say it's like something like 70 credits or something. So, Damn. Yeah. Like, she's been in a ton of crap. So, like, why is she the other one that's not allowed to talk? <laughs> hey, don't forget about Billy. Then he let him say one word. Oh, uh, that's going to make me angry again. I can't even talk about it. Damn it. <laughs> we did gloss over one really important scene, which is Kwong gives his pitch on why he should train Jake to fight in this tournament. Um, and which is, that- it's a pretty bad pitch, honestly. <laughs> because, I mean, he's already, he's only got one kidney. And then now he's got to <laughs> give up 20%. To this he says fake he Miyagi wants 40%. guy. They end up sailing on 20. Yeah, 40 originally. Yeah. After some thinking time, Jake agrees. And then the next day, Kwong takes Jake to the gym where all the fighters are doing their training for the Blood Fist. It's like some sort of sport out of blood. I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, so, so, I mean, I'm still working on the name. I mean, it's also like another movie where they go around and then he introduces them like all like, this is so-and-so from Germany. He fights like that. Yeah. <laughs> this is Black and, Rose. And, and so... He won't talk for the rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> this is Chin Wu. He got the napalm. <laughs> He's very so, mean. <laughs> yes, yeah. So, so I think this is... This is a good time to introduce these actors as well. And I appreciate Kwong kind of quickly introducing everybody uh, and kind of getting it out of the way. So we have Raton. Raton is played by Rob Kamen. And Rob Kamen is JCVD kind of regular. He played Morris in Maximum Risk. He was Glock in Legionnaire. And he was a goon in Double Team with Dennis Rodman. Uh, Aside from that, Raton trains UFC fighter Brandon Vera in kickboxing and was World Kickboxing Association Junior Light Heavyweight Champion. And then we meet Chin Wu. And Chin Wu is Chris Aguilar. He is a stuntman in the movie The Chain with Gary Busey, which looks terrible. (laughs) He plays Kinto in something called Robo Warriors in 96, which looks amazing. I want to see that. And and I meant to bring this up during all of the eight Blood Fist movies, but there is actually a ninth Blood Fist that came out in 20, 2005 that I forgot to include. He is in that called Blood Fist 2050. <laughs> He's also a Southeast Asian kickboxing champion himself, and he is... Manny Pacquiao's lead of security, as mm. well as Manny Pacquiao's assistant pastor. <laughs> what? So he's his yes, Jin Wu, the guy who assistant plays pastor. <laughs> so Jin the... Wu's the guy. Just to give you guys perspective, Jin Wu's the guy who is murdering all the fighters he faces and got burned up with the napalm. That guy, he is the head of security for Manny Pacquiao, the politician and boxer, as well as his assistant pastor. <laughs> And then our last fighter is Black Rose, played by Billy Blanks. <sighs> Billy Blanks is an action movie star. We talk about him all the time and all the great movies he's been. He's also famous 
for not only being a kung fu martial artist, but also for coming up with the workout Tai Bo. And actually, his kid came up with his own workout routine and was on Shark Tank. But I guess he needed to go on Shark Tank because I guess him and his dad don't get along and his dad mm. won't give him money for his own shit. Like, he's got to kind of do it on his own. And I think this might answer the question of why he's so tough with all his kids is that he is one of 15 kids. Damn. Yeah, he is one of 15 kids from Erie, Pennsylvania, which I didn't know was an actual place. I thought that was a, <laughs> just a Nickelodeon TV show. I didn't know that Erie, Pennsylvania was actually a place. He is a black belt in actual Taekwondo, a seventh degree black belt. And a fourth degree black belt and just kung fu. They don't tell me what kind of kung fu, just kung fu, just in general. <laughs> and all of them. Listen, people, if you're sheltering in place and you're on Instagram and you're like, I don't know, I'm looking to see if there's workout videos. That way I can get in shape while I'm still staying at home. Put down the phone, go get Taibo. <laughs> That's your workout routine right there. Do the Taibo. Do it for Billy. No. Billy needs your support. No, I, I have something even better for you because did you guys know? That Billy Blanks worked is listed as stunts for the movie Kazam in 1996. <laughs> really? And so he is likely responsible for Shaquille O'Neal's Kung Fu in the movie Shazam. <laughs> that is Billy Blanks. That is his prompt. That is his fault. So, so after he introduces all of these great fighters, Kwong takes him outside and says, I'm going to train you in the greatest gym in the world. Run up to the top of this fucking volcano. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and guys, apparently it's three kilometers, uh, which is something like, like I think it's like six miles or six blocks. Like, I don't know. I'm not sure which. <laughs> Stupid um, metric system. <laughs> so every day he's supposed to climb this volcano, and then he might be able to come back and get a mango. That mango is going to come back later. We're going to talk about that mango. You don't want that mango. <laughs> That looks like a potato. <laughs> we get so we get a whole montage, like a whole like two minute montage of him working out. And guys, he looks pretty good for a guy with one kidney. <laughs> yeah, he's also not very nimble. Also, he didn't. He only brought one change of clothes. He wears those white sweats the entire time. That's Even after those kids all pelt him with those oranges, yeah, and he's punching yep. that bag what full happened? of goat shit. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to the Hard Rock T-shirt? That's the only thing I can't figure out. Did he tuck? Did he lose it on the rooftop to his belly button? <laughs> the training montage is so confusing because I don't understand how it's gonna make him a better fighter. He is lifting weights, he's running, but I'll see he's doing some. He's like kicking bottles, but that's about it. There's no ghost of Bruce Lee. There's no diving out of the way of bags hanging from the ceiling. There's nobody threw any crap in his eyeballs or yeah. blinded him. <laughs> Nobody blindfolded that man and made him do the splits. I'm just saying. So you call that a training montage? He didn't have any big logs on his head like Rocky, like going up and down snow. <laughs> I also want to point out that there's a point in the montage in which Billy Blinks has this really corny look and then he just gives him this really kind of smile and nod. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, like, yeah. It, it is really, really weird. <laughs> That is that is the best part of the training is, is those scenes where the fighters are looking down at him. It's not like they went out into nature. They're literally right outside the building <laughs> where everyone else is yes. training. When he's a bar with bricks on it doing curls while they're inside the gym. And everyone's like, they come over and they look like, is he still down? They're like, yeah, he's still down. He's punching that stupid bag full of shit. Yeah. <laughs> and they're like shaking their heads like, dumbass. <laughs> but of course, now that when he gets back, Nancy's interested. Doing I mean, some Kama Sutra style stretching with them. Yeah, of course she's oh, interested. Yeah. She's oh, like yeah. a hooker. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> well, that's what we find out later is that she's actually a stripper. She's so, a stripper. Like, man, him, he, he's lucky, man. Meeting up with Davey. He's like, what a lucky day. Gets to bone his sister. And, and like at one point, like he starts making out with his sister, like getting all grabby. And his, D Davies walks in. And he's like, all right. <laughs> yeah, they're like naked. And he's like, ew. And he's like, why? Like, oh, whatever. <laughs> Which is very confusing because a few scenes later, we're back up on the rooftop because obviously that's where we train when we're not training. <laughs> when we're not training outside of the fighters gym, we are training on the rooftop. <laughs> and at first, like they're playing, at first, like they're playing grab ass, him and Davies, like they're supposed to spar together and they're kind of just grabbing ass and fucking around. And so in order to get him to Kwong to get them to take it seriously, he whispers to Davies that 
uh, Jake just railed the crap out of his sister. <laughs> Seems to piss him off enough to get him to take it seriously, and they start actually fighting. That scene <laughs> hasn't happened yet where he stumbles on them in the room. So he still doesn't know. Kwong oh, is the yeah. one that's no. seeing them. That's doing it. No, it's later. Oh, okay. It's, it is later. It's okay. it's later because it's like the night before when he and he oh, oversleeps right. yeah. and he comes in late and stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah. I remember that. You're right. Um, You're right. So baby doesn't know yet, but Kwong is he cuts straight to the throat. He's I need you to go hard against Jake because he's really tired after, after fucking your sister all day. That's yeah, exactly what he, said, he says. Yeah, he said he's really yeah. tired because she kept him up all night having sex. <laughs> baby looks like something out of the three stooges. He's like, blah, 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 blah. I'm mad now. <laughs> <laughs> Davies gets him a couple shots, but then man, Jake beats Baby's ass. Like lets him know, like, hey man, this is how this relationship works. And I think after that, like, there's no, he doesn't have to worry about paying rent no more. Babies ain't gonna try and kick him out after this. Like he gives <laughs> Baby a whooping. So after that's all said and done, that means that it's cool for Jake to start coming to the strip club and even jumping out of the oh, roof yeah. to protect Nancy. But they never talked about her working at a strip club. Like, I didn't understand what was going on in that scene. I'm like, okay, so there's some, they're at a strip club. Okay. Oh, wait, that's Nancy with her weird boobs. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> they never let us know at all that she works as a stripper. And then on the side note, too, she's terrible at it. She's no wonder she's practicing on <laughs> well, the roof. She's room. not a good dancer. Okay. <laughs> She is not, it turns out she is not flexible and she is not a good dancer, which makes not a good stripper. <laughs> <laughs> the next day at the volcano, another montage. Don looks like he can't run for more than 20 seconds because they have to cut away all the time. So like, we just want you to sprint to the top of that hill real fast. And then we're going to get it from this angle and this angle and this angle, because every time you stop, we have to put in a cut. <laughs> Which it turns out is a good thing because I actually looked it up and three kilometers is only 1.86 miles. So that's not even two miles he's being asked to run. <laughs> so now it's actually over to the Ta Chang and the fight or the blood fist or whatever they call this fight. First fight. I shouldn't be mean like that. He only has one kidney. <laughs> <laughs> Baby's card gets called. He's nervous about getting Chin Wu first, but he does not. He gets someone else. He destroys them. Angela's there too. She sneaks in and watch the fight. You know, she's always got baby's back. Yeah, because she's she does. For him. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> she also takes Jake around and shows him the glory hole in the in the coat closet. I'm assuming that's what they use that. For. I'm assuming that's what it's supposed to be used for. It looks like a glory hole. Um, and then the watcher, the the fighters just just hang out in there and watch. You know, it, when it's not being used, obviously. So that would be awkward. <laughs> Of course, all the fights go as planned. Black Rose wins is all that matters. Jake also wins, I guess. We got to talk about that. Jake's not winning, but then he gets punched and he starts to bleed. And then it's time to really fight. You really pissed me off now. Yeah. He does fight Raton first. And Raton is weird enough wearing an earpiece. And at first I couldn't figure out, like, is the earpiece supposed to help him with his, like, hamster style? Or, like, <laughs> is it supposed to help him cheat somehow? Is there someone on the other end of those headphones? I don't know what it's supposed to be for either because he ends up with the tape from N Nancy's tape for learning the local language. No, she's got that tape on. That's what that's supposed to be. She gets really nervous from watching what's going on. She puts her headphones on and it's supposed to be like you're hearing what she's hearing. I don't think that's it. I think because she stops and takes the tape out, she's all confused. And the German guy looks at his trainer. They're oh, all confused okay, so too. Maybe that's, what that's, that's what's in his ear. Uh -huh. He hears that. And I don't understand why it's even in the movie. <laughs> I don't either. I, never <laughs> I don't that either. Here. It's really weird that they even included that in the movie. They didn't have to include the earpieces at all, in my opinion. Long story short, he wins his fight. He gets $1,000 minus 80%. <laughs> and then it's party time. And this is a scene that we get to where Jake and Nancy are talking up on the roof again. Yeah. She tries More to rooftops. make a pass at him. Jake's like, I can't do that. And then she leaves and he takes his shirt off and changes his mind and goes down to take Nancy to pound town. Because she's already down there naked. <laughs> and then <laughs> oh, she's wearing like a, just a shirt. Nothing yeah. else underneath. Yeah. And then that's when baby and Angela come in. He's like, ew. Then they go up. On, they then go up on up to the roof. <laughs> then they go back and on the roof. And then he takes Angela to pound town. But she, no, she takes him to pound town. He's like, <laughs> he's like, what do we, she initiates it. And he's like, oh, uh, rolling around. <laughs> Gonna go give him some, <laughs> some more of them hot dogs. <laughs> oh. This is Nancy. <laughs> We've more fights the next day. Kwong is pissed because Jake is late. Black Rose destroys some tomato can. Chin Wu eats a cockroach. Nancy 
talks about he so the big thing for this scene is that she gives nancy a picture of his brother and she starts to ask around and there happens to be one person that knows some information we're starting to get scenes where he's starting to try and solve his brother trying to look into his brother's murder more and this is where we keep seeing scenes with the guy with the blue hat that stole his brother's hat and every time he tries to go after him he ends up losing him in the crowd or stuff like that but this is when he starts when jake starts to try and figure out who actually killed his his brother um, and at the same time, Black Rose keeps winning, Baby wins, Wu keeps murdering people, which I guess he's just allowed to murder however many people he wants. <laughs> like, no one's going to tell Wu not to. The next day, Jake is talking to Nancy, and Nancy has found out that some man called the Snake, because he had found that out earlier, the Snake is the one that killed him, but the Snake just means like whoever the, the, the best fighter is in the tournament. Last year, it was Chin Wu. So that's, if you're looking at someone who might have killed your brother, it's probably Chin Wu. She also says that all Mike cared about was money. And Jake doesn't like that answer, but we know as viewers, that was the case. Yeah. But this is when Hal shows up, and he just nonchalantly says, I lost the gym, tax man came, and I had to abandon it. So now I'm just on a really long vacation here in Manila. Let's just go do, let's talk about something else. And Jake wants to talk more about it because he says, all my stuff and all my money was invested in that gym. What do you mean it's all gone now? Yeah, and he's like, oh, and we'll house, talk about oh, it later. Whatever. The manager's great, too, because he's like this hippie biker dude. He totally just shows up out of the blue. It's really weird how he interacts with him through the rest of the movie. Because is he staying with Baby 2? Is that what's <laughs> happening? Or does he have his own place? Is he, he paying for else. his own place? <laughs> Okay, is he paying for that with the money from the gym? Because I feel like he already mismanaged that. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's like trying to start his own gym there in Manila because you see later he's trying to get these kids to go put flyers out on cars. And that's when, and this is when Melissa caught it. I didn't catch it when we were first watching it, that Kwong and Jake are walking out. They're going to go, they're leaving one place. They're going to go to see what Kwong knows where the man that's wearing the Dodgers hat. Yeah, so it's after he fights black rose he fights and he beats black rose he can see in the audience the guy with the black the, the dodger hat and he's like distracted by that and he tells his whatever it's, what's his name what is the trainer's name Kwong. Kwong. he's like go Kwong. get that guy and i'll take care of this like I'll, I'll finish off black rose or whatever and he's like okay so he goes over there and he tells him like meet him at his house like at this time after the fight and they're storming off to go do that and then there's hal trying to be like hey we need to talk and and uh jake's like i can't talk right now and as they're walking away, Hal goes, I know that guy from somewhere. I just can't place it. And he puts his like finger on his face, like, you know, very like that's supposed to mean something. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> they get over to that house and it's a setup. The guy's dead, and then the police come rushing in, so they have to like run off. That way that they, they don't get arrested. Is that what happens in that scene? And or do they talk to the police? No, they don't yeah. So basically him and Kwong walk in. The they see dead. the dead guy. Kwong immediately goes, it's a setup. Let's get out of here. Jake takes off running as the cops are pulling up. But Kwong, he's still hanging around. So like at first, I thought, well, that means Kwong's going to get arrested. But then we see in a later scene, they actually must have got away because they actually arrest Jake. And then Kwong shows up, and I'm assuming probably dimed him out to the police too. But he shows up and he helps sneak him the key to break him out. I have to say, when I first, at first watching this, I was getting really nervous that this movie was setting up just like another movie, uh, Blood Boxer or Kick Fist or something. <laughs> yeah, like something about I was friend. getting really, really nervous. I was starting to really sweat. I see where you're going because Baby pulls Chin Wu, and he's really scared about that. It's like a best friend that goes in and fights the number one fighter who's also very ruthless. Yes, exactly. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> But he doesn't kill him. He's in a coma. Although it looked like he killed him. <laughs> I he thought he might have killed him. him first. Yeah. <laughs> he squashed him like a bug. He stepped on his chest. I, I was so mad at that point in the movie. Like, oh my God, this is just a ripoff. And then it turns out it wasn't. So now we're going to get to the scene that Melissa really, really wants to talk about. So, John, you're right. Jake gets arrested. Quan comes later, sneaks him the key and a mango. A poisoned mango. In which we see earlier that had been poisoned. And then he tells them at four o'clock the next day, they're going to come in for like, when you're like, arraignment, like change, you, yeah. you'll be able to break out. Melissa, I want you to take it from here. 
from when what you what do you see from here until Jake shows up to the gym? Well, he breaks out, he beats up the guard, he takes out the mango, which is a mango, okay? I mean, not a banana, it's a freaking mango. And then he's running down the street, peeling the mango as if it's a banana and eating it like a banana. <laughs> I thought that was a banana. No, it's a I mango. literally wrote down, wait, when did it I literally so, wrote down, wait, when did he get a banana? Yeah, like did he stop mango. and get a banana? It's the mango that the that the trainer injects with the drugs at the hospital. He injects it with, I'm like, okay, first of all, I thought it was a potato. So I'm going to have to clear. <laughs> no, that's that mango. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. He gives them the mango. He's like, here, have like for you to have something to eat too. Like eat this when you need it. So he's running to go meet, to make it to the fight. And he's eating this mango like it's a banana, peeling it. Let's peel like a banana. <laughs> Mangoes have giant, like not pits, but like this rough thing in yeah. the middle. How the, is he eating it like a <laughs> I don't know. I swear to God. I swear that's a banana. I, 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 I thought he it's was not. Eating. It's the mango. <laughs> Which is why when he gets there, finally gets there and he gets into the ring, he's a little bit woozy and he's a little bit dizzy. But miraculously, that goes away. So I also think it's important that that when Wu puts Davies in the hospital, that we do see that he has an earpiece in as well. So, oh, I didn't see that. Does he does? Yeah, he does. He does. I did make a note of that. So that would explain um, why the German guy ended up with the wrong tape, because that means that Kwong took the wrong tape from baby's apartment at some point in time. Yeah. Kwong okay. is the one that's giving them all these tapes. See, we're I mean, working together. We're, we're figuring this out together. <laughs> so, John, I think this is the part where we're going to divulge from Melissa. Because we get mm -hmm. to the what I consider to be where the movie gets really, really good. Because we're going to end up all these twists. There's the fight. He gets dizzy. And then Angela comes in because Baby has died in the hospital. So she gets mm -hmm. a gun and comes down to the gym to take care of Chin Wu. But of course, Jake can't let that happen. So he roundhouse kicks her. Uh, no, he roundhouse kicks Wu so that she misses. And then Wu gets up and slap his Angela into the crowd. Fight continues, and he continues to fight, thinking that he's uh, trying to avenge his brother. It's starting to dawn on him that Wu is not the one who killed his brother. No, so, no, he, and he isn't doesn't that, know. No, no, I'm sorry. That's right, he doesn't know. So he's still trying to get his revenge. That's why he stops her from shooting Wu, because he wants the revenge. Yeah. Out of the blue... He decides to roundhouse kick, and I didn't get it at first, but you're right. He he wanted to get his own revenge. Yeah. So then, and then he just absolutely destroys Wu. No, you're still you're still missing the point. The part before he destroys Wu. Oh yes. Hal yells out. He starts Hal's in the crowd. He's putting it all together. He's looking at the bedding. He's looking around. He's like. God, like putting his finger to his head, like this is <laughs> like you could. It's like that that meme where they got the the math stuff on the board. <laughs> That's how. And then, <laughs> then you see, then they're shaking the ring. He's like really woozy and drowsy, and Hal yells out in a really woozy voice because it's <laughs> it's him hearing it. I know you're who your trainer is. He's from Modesto. Like he <laughs> brother work used to work together. And he would throw he's fights. Of course he's from a He's the snake. Mm -hmm. That's what his name is called and whatever. He's betting against you. He's the one who killed your brother. He yells <laughs> out. And then, then, then he gets up and like puts it together. Okay. He gets up. He beats Wu. Like beats him up. And then there's Angela dead. That was like the most crushing part that Jake let that happen too. He he could have just let her shoot Wu and yep. it wouldn't have mattered. Then he, he's got blood on his hands. He killed Angela. Yes, he did. And all yeah. he did was love yeah. baby. That's her only crime was loving baby. <laughs> so ultimately, Jake ends up killing Wu. So now not only that not only was he, he responsible for Angela, but he actually murdered someone himself now at this point. So now he's a murderer. He's an accessory to murder, and then it leads to him basically chasing Kwong, get his revenge. Now he's like, he's going down his checklist, right? He got Wu, he's going to go outside, he's going to go get Kwong. They go outside, rain, heavy rain, they're going to do battle in the streets, and they actually end up in the same alley on where Mike, Jake's brother, was killed. Guess what? Surprise ninja attack! 
<laughs> a short, wild-haired ninja comes out of the shadows. <laughs> and this is when the biggest twist comes in, is in these final scenes. So we find out that at first, Jake thinks it's about the money, that the snake is setting up these fights, and that Mike wasn't willing to take a dive, and so he lost a bunch of money. Then he went and found Mike later and killed him. But then it comes back that Mike not only didn't throw the fight, but then he killed Kwong's brother. During that fight. So During that, that fight. the very beginning, yep. Kwong's brother. And so not only so is this it is about all the money, Mike's fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not just about the money. It's also family revenge. Mm-hmm. It's a great twist, Melissa. It's a great yeah, twist. It would be a great twist yeah. if I hadn't figured I was it so... out in the, the first 30 <laughs> minutes of the movie. <laughs> All right, I will give it to you. It is clearly not the actor who plays Wu who kills Mike earlier in the movie, but we don't see his face. Now, my issue is is that I, I've seen a ton of these bad movies. Just because it wasn't the same actor doesn't mean that that's not how the story is going to play out at the end. True. So I was, I was kind of mad because I was expecting Wu to still end up being the bad guy. And like, well, that was kind of stupid. Like, it's clearly not him who kills Mike earlier. So for it to actually be Kwong... It actually caught me off guard a little bit because I don't think I was, I wasn't as, it, I hadn't noticed as much with the storyline. And then like to Dominic's point, I really didn't think about that the guy at the beginning who gets killed by Mike, that that's Kwong's brother. Yes, exactly. And that's the best twist here at the end is that it's not just about the money, that it's also about that he killed his brother. He set this whole thing up to get the revenge. And also make money. And if it wasn't for the money part, he would have gotten away with it, too. We've, but he talks about it when he talks about his brother dying in the ring and all that. When he's at the when he's over there looking at his grave. Mm -hmm. And then Jake's like, mm -hmm. who's this? <laughs> <laughs> he talks about it, but he doesn't specifically Yeah, but he doesn't. All right. I'm so, so happy with this. Just to get us to the end of the movie. The last scene of the movie after he so basically he fights Kwong to the death and kills Kwong. And then when he leaves, so now he's murdered Kwong and Wu, and he's by association murdered Angela. And also he, baby. <laughs> <laughs> he leaves and runs into Nancy. They run into each other's arms, and then I assuming I'm assuming they leave the country very quickly. <laughs> um, because he's wanted for multiple murders at this point and uh, breaking out of jail too. Also, where was she where baby when baby was dying? She was watching some guy she met three days ago that she's sleeping with. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> That's the kind of and Angela was by his side the entire time, but she was with some guy she banged for three nights in a row. <laughs> Well, most I don't care what you say. I love the end of this movie, and I'm going to defend it in my final thoughts, too. So <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> Before we get there, let's go talk about this week's music, which um, I don't know what to expect because I Who don't Who played that flute? No, <laughs> <laughs> let's go break this music down. All right, John, to be totally honest with you, this movie had music? Question mark. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's a Corman movie, so it's, I have low expectations of who they got to do music, but I am also very interested to find out what music there was in this movie. What do you got for us this week? You're right. There really isn't. There is no actual soundtrack. So the actual, any actual music in this movie was done by a composer, and that composer is Sasha Matson. So in Sasha Matson, per SashaMatson.com, he's done a few s film scores. <laughs> He also did the movies Lies in Love, Island of the Bounty, Lobster Men from Mars, <laughs> Lobster Men from Mars, Red Surf, <laughs> Daddy's Bag, and Shadows in the Storm, River of Death. It sounds like he's only done Corman movies. Well, you would think that. So, and by the way, I want to see Lobsters from Mars. I really want to see that. But apparently Red Surf starred... George Clooney and Gene Simmons. Wow. Okay, how do we get our hands on that one? Because the last Gene Simmons movie we watched, I loved it. Oh my God, it was fantastic. Yeah. Yes. And <laughs> George Clooney, like literally George Clooney's like 19 in this movie. It's called Red Surf. So he also did some, composed some scores for the TV show Liberty and Bash. 
which is about two tough L.A. social workers who come together and fight crime. And it stars <laughs> Lou Ferrigno. Oh, man, it just kept getting better. <laughs> yes, it stars the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> Aside from his movie score work, Sasha Madsen also wrote and composed a jazz opera about baseball called Cooperstown. Jazz opera in nine innings. In my delirium for baseball, I'm actually like, oh, okay, sounds interesting. That sounds completely awful. <laughs> I, I have no idea. If you go to SashaMatson.com, it is the main thing on the website. So it is, must be his most recent thing to do. That is SashaMatson.com. <laughs> and it's Cooperstown Jazz Opera and Nine Innings. Actually, it doesn't look, it actually looks like it might be an entertaining show. I'm not big on musicals, so but I do like jazz, so maybe. Otherwise, he's done other projects. He did a project called The Tight Lines Project, which is another music album he released. Uh, and a little background, he was born in Seattle and grew up in Berkeley. Mm. And he got his PhD in music theory and composition from UCLA. While after UCLA, he did some scores in LA of the movies I mentioned. He taught music theory for a long time for LaGrange College, Long Island University, and State University of New York. He also writes for a website called Stereophile.com, which I think has a magazine that goes along with that, too. I don't know if that's his magazine and his website or if he's just a writer there. I think he, I, I don't know. So I couldn't tell if he's just a writer there or if he actually runs the whole website. But it's called Stereophile.com. It's basically about stereo equipment. Like, a, like reviewing stereo equipment, talking about new stuff that's coming out on the market, new microphones, like that type of stuff. So if you're interested in that, check out Stereophile.com or you can check out SashaMadsen.com and uh, listen to uh, or go see an opera, a jazz opera, about baseball. He's actually quite accomplished for being a Roger Corman sound composition. <laughs> 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 he clearly has the background being a teacher and everything and it was clearly like he got his degree from ucla in the 90s tried to get into the music business doing film scores and stuff like did it for a while never did anything like like on a major scale and just got into teaching afterwards and then since then he's done other side projects but yeah definitely more accomplished than i expected especially when i first looked it was like i couldn't find anything and so i'm like searching the credits for like who did the music you know and it's like okay <laughs> all right good there is something to actually talk about here also in good news very good news for our first episode of you should watch it Red Sand is available Red on Tubi. Surf. Red, Red surf, surf, sorry. Red Surf is available on Tubi. I just looked it up. Yes. <laughs> yes. Gene Simmons and George Clooney, here we come. It's got jet skis in it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that reminds me of last week, you know, with the movie with uh, Brad Pitt about being a cross-country, high school cross-country runner. Yeah. Like, like, how did I not know any of these movies existed? <laughs> oh, I, I literally movie. thought George Clooney's <laughs> career started with Roseanne. Like, I have no idea that he did anything before that. Well, John, I was not disappointed in music. Uh, it's every week I'm always like, oh, no, this is going to be the one where he doesn't have anything to talk about. And literally the only time you've had that is when Vice had no music in an episode. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, that, that's, it literally took them giving me nothing. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's go give our final thoughts on this movie for or against. The battle is on. <laughs> let's go give our final thoughts. All right, Melissa, I'm going to give you the floor first. I'm going to let you get your grievances out. What's your final thoughts on Blood Fist? I'm going to preface this by saying that I like Dawn the Dragon Wilson. I could watch more movies from him. I will not watch the seven other Blood Fists <laughs> where he's whatever, Tom <laughs> Turner. Or, oh, well, <laughs> I don't know. Remember, whatever apparently there's eight because I forgot to include Blood Fist 2050. Exactly. So. Okay. So I will not watch the other eight because they are just ripoffs of Bloodsport. I said it there. Okay. <laughs> that was not the Kumite. That was some janky, <laughs> 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 some janky with middle-aged fat men as guards. No, I don't think so. That doesn't fly. Oh, uh, uh, but he won the tournament with only one kidney. <laughs> uh, excuse me, but JCVD wins it with no eyes. Okay, he's blinded. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, back to what I'm saying. It's a ripoff. And I figured out what was going on 30 minutes into the movie, and then it was boring. 
<laughs> it's not a good movie. They're not good actors. The fight scenes are cool. I will say that the, the the fighting is good because I know it's real fighters and you can tell. And like I'm sure he's a fantastic real fighter in real life. He is not so good at the fake. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I didn't like it. The mango thing that really bugged the crap out of me. You can't eat a freaking mango like that. <laughs> I have cut so many mangoes up to make baby food. You can't do that, okay? It's not realistic. So you're saying that there's no way that he exchanged it for a poison banana on his way there. <laughs> also, and on a real note, Angela dies when she's just trying to like defend the man that she loves, who she's taken care of the whole entire movie. And then she dies because he's like, no, I want to kill. I want to be the person to kill him. What a petty crap move that is. And he doesn't even care. No one even cares. And Nancy don't even give a mm. crap that her brother's dead. She's watching some guy she's been screwing for three days instead. <laughs> so, yeah, I got real strong feelings on that. And and the fight scene at the end, it's not even that good. Okay? So there, I said it. <laughs> Seattle Karate is definitely on top of L.A. Karate. It's true. <laughs> Seattle Karate is good. L.A. Karate is bad. <laughs> the end. <laughs> John, what are your final thoughts? For the first two-thirds of that movie, I was kind of along the same lines as Melissa in that I was getting mad that it was just a ripoff of Bloodsport. I kept thinking, like, man, this can't just be a ripoff of Bloodsport. Like, because then we're going to do Bloodsport, and it's going to be terrible. You know, can't have two. <laughs> like, it, it, we can't do a movie that's a ripoff of another one that we're going to do. And then, like, the twist came. And it was like, oh my god, this is so much better that they have this twist here. Because one, it's not a complete ripoff of Bloodsport. So like, yes, there is the similarity of Baby and his buddy in Bloodsport both getting murdered, basically. Also the um, brother. Because that's yeah, why John and, Codman and the bro- goes there too. Yeah. His brother. <laughs> so, so there is the two similarities there. But I appreciate the fact that they included the whole storyline with Kwong and everything. And the reason I am okay with it and I don't feel like it's a ripoff is because they went out of their way to write that whole storyline in with Kwong. And because Kwong set everything up from the beginning, it it caught me off guard. It caught me off guard a little bit that it was Kwong. I was expecting it to, uh, I was was waiting for it to, to be someone else. And then when we got to a certain spot, I thought, that it has to be Wu, and then it was like, oh, it can be the manager, and then once I realized, like, oh, it is the manager. Think about this, all right? So one, at the very beginning, his brother Mike, clearly, so he, so he, him and the guy he's fighting against are both working for Kwong. We know that now at the end of the movie. So not only does he screw Kwong out of the money that he's betting on, against him with, why does he go as far as the killer's brother? Like, why does he take it that far? On the reverse end, we keep seeing that the other fighters have the earpieces in when they're fighting against Jake. And like I said earlier, like, he could have got away with it because after he kills his brother, he convinces him that Wu killed his his brother. But he could literally just go on winning and just keep telling every fighter that Jake fights to just take a dive. Like, I don't understand why Jake ends up killing or practically killing black rose does it doesn't he kill black rose no he didn't no, kill him no no he no, just no. Beats him. okay i get at the end he's letting him exact his revenge by killing Wu. like he literally could have just kept the charade going and it just kept betting on jake and betting and having all of his fighters take a dive because apparently everyone else works for qualm at least that's what we're supposed to understand because everyone he fights has the earpiece in Okay, but everyone so, he fights that has the earpiece in also doesn't speak the language that they speak. So maybe they're wearing the earpiece so they can translate it or something. They're all like, they're all speak well, English I'm, except the. I, I, I'm, I'm the, assuming yeah. so, uh, and, and I I don't know if this works in with the movie, but I'm assuming Quan would be. Wouldn't it make more sense that Quan was betting on Jake and telling the other fighters to take a dive? Yeah, it the could, whole yeah. time. So then, like. None of the, all of the fights were fixed at that point, and so Jake thinks he's winning, but he's really had hasn't won any fights. All of the fighters have just been taking dives throughout the whole film, except for Wu. Well, I'm gonna say that by the end of this movie, I'm a fan. I'm so much of a fan. Uh, well, I, and I, I think that's ultimately for me is that is that I like the movie because of all the interesting angles that the twist throws in there. I guess was my point. I'm in it enough that I'm willing to watch the second one. I don't know about the other six, but I'm willing to watch the continuation of the Jake Ray 
story. I'm going to agree with John on a lot of points. Like the movie for the first two thirds is like, it's okay. It's an okay action movie. It is a rip off of Bloodsport. Like whatever, you you kind of know what the, the plot points are going to be. You follow along. But the end nails it. Nails it. And I'm not saying it's better than Bloodsport. I'm just saying that I like it. It but, does, It brings it back home. It, it it fixes it fixes it for you. What I'm going to use my final thoughts for is to complain about the use of Billy Blanks. God damn it! He's <laughs> in the movie. He's on the cover of the movie. He has no speaking lines and loses in the second round. I am very or third round. I am very upset with this movie and how they treated Billy Blanks. Very upset. The man is a legend. How could you do this to him? Not even give him a speaking part. But I'm going to let that slide. <laughs> I'm going to be okay. The movie ends up being okay. I like Dawn in this movie. I like everyone else except for Nancy. <laughs> I like everyone else and how they are in this movie. <laughs> the storyline is pretty good. The twist at the end is great. It's not just about the money, but it's also a family feud thing. As they're both trying to get revenge for their brother. They killed each other's brothers, and now they're trying to get revenge against each other. It's so great. I love it. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We would love to hear from you. Email is goldtheheat at gmail.com. I'm sorry. I forgot to put in there. Seattle Karate still reigns supreme here. Of course it does. I think that's the takeaway is that LA Karate definitely impressed us. But I think ultimately Seattle Karate is still is still top notch. Exactly. So that's going to do it for us this week. We would love to hear from you. Email is goldtheheat at gmail.com. How does LA stack up against Seattle? How does blood fist stack up against no retreat no surrender we want to hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com get us on twitter at go with the heat facebook.com slash go with the heat instagram.com slash go with the heat we would love to hear from you and what your thoughts are on this movie how it compares to seattle karate how these two movies compare against each other and early thoughts for what our next movie is going to be which is going to be blood sport yep we're going to go right into right into Bloodsport because oh, it just yeah. felt like a natural fit for what the next movie that we should do. We already did JCVD. We already did a copycat of it. It's time to do the original. Exactly. And I think that's going to help us decide between who advances one between JCVD and Seattle Karate because he was in that movie. And two, where he, if, he, if Seattle Karate wins that, where does he rank against what Melissa accuses as being the Bloodsport ripoff? Does he beat? <laughs> does Toronto beat LA at least? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so you know what we want you to do? We want you to go to your podcast, your platform of choice, probably iTunes or Apple Podcasts, whatever they're calling it now. Go in there, give us five stars. Just no, no one's even going to know that you. I told you to give us five stars, and then in the review, we want you to re compare. LA Karate versus Seattle Karate. No context. Just say which one you think is better and why. <laughs> no context into why you're saying it. Just like totally rip on the losing city and just leave that in your review. Be sure to check out that website, go with the heat.com. You can find all the ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support the show. Support step number one. We want to hear from you. Email us, go with the heat at gmail.com. Get us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Support step number two. We want to hear from you, goddammit. <laughs> we want to hear about, from you about this movie and about our next movie, Bloodsport. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.